All right, good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? We are so spread out tonight. There's nobody in the middle. Nobody, everybody's on the sides. It's all good. Everybody's doing good tonight? All right, hey, so we are going to continue our series in Genesis tonight, walking through Scripture. But before we do that, we have a special guest that's going to be with us for about four minutes and 45 seconds. Um, So uh, if you guys are not aware of it, we have some students that participate in what the Assemblies of God calls fine arts. And one of the things in fine arts is a short sermon and the short sermon is a five-minute sermon. And Jenna Lee Smith uh, preached a short sermon at the Sectional Fine Arts and is moving on to the National Fine Arts. And so um, she got to preach this a few times. She preached it down in the youth group a couple weeks ago. And uh, so we wanted to give her another opportunity to continue to fine-tune her skills and preaching. So we are going to be a captive audience for her short sermon, and she can come and introduce herself. All right. I got this. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Um, Yeah, so my sermon is called To This You Are Called. Um, Yeah, so I'm going to start. In the movie Night at the Museum, (laughs) there's a scene where a security guard and a monkey go back and forth slapping each other in the face, trying to get revenge for the previous slap. They kept slapping each other, and it ended up turning into a cycle of slaps. It is so easy and natural for us to repay evil for evil. If you've ever been bumped into or cut off in traffic, you know that sometimes it can be easier to just call the person names or get mad rather than to be patient. But we don't need to repeat that cycle. 1 Peter 3.9 states, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called that you might inherit a blessing. Peter wrote about how suffering is a part of a Christian's reality. Evil, right? But how are Christians persecuted today? From personal experience, I've noticed that at school, and even in regular life, that people are passive-aggressive, insulting, attacking, and accusatory towards Christians. Through all of this, we are called to bless and be blessed. So let's look at the words repay and blessing so that we can better understand what we're reading in the verse. The definition of repay is to give up, give back, or restore. In the verse, Peter is saying that we aren't to return evil for evil. Instead, we are to return or give back blessing in the face of evil. But what exactly is a blessing? The word blessing means to speak well of or praise. You might have noticed that the verse used blessing twice. Oh, don't want to miss those blessings. Let's read it again. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you are called so that you might inherit a blessing. The first time, blessing is used to show that we, as Christians, need to bless and speak well of others. The second time the word is used, it shows that we can receive the blessing. What could it be like for you to be a blessing? Well, of course, it could be paying for another person's lunch or tutoring a classmate. It could look like being patient and forgiving when someone fails you, or being quick to apologize and accepting responsibility when you're wrong. It might also look like being encouraging and praying for the person who cut you off in traffic. (laughs) So what might happen if you don't bless? What happens? continue, accelerate, and escalate destructive paths. A minor incident becomes road rage, leaving the other person distraught and you fighting for peace. Have you ever heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people? This is basically saying that when people are hurt on the inside, they're more likely to hurt others. This is evil repaying evil. Here's an unfortunate example. According to OJP.gov, one-third of people who are abused in childhood grow up to be abusive parents or adults. But Jesus shows us a different way. Let me say that again. Jesus shows us a different way. When brutal acts were done to him, he interceded for those who hurt him, saying, Father, forgive them. Although they eventually killed him, Jesus chose to forgive. You and I have the opportunity to be like Jesus and forgive. 
Peter wrote to the followers of Christ to remind them that they had been called to inherit a blessing. And if you're a Christian today, you're called to that same blessing. What is the blessing? Well, the blessing is eternal life, of course. And it's through Jesus. The ability to bring the blessing of eternal life to others. What is God, through Peter, asking you to do? Well, rejoice in your inheritance. No one can take it from you. You don't need to fight. Instead, you have the power to bless. When you choose to bless, it can change so many lives for eternity. I'm betting you haven't been slapped by a capuchin monkey, but I'm sure that you felt the sting of evil and insults. Nevertheless, you have been called. You have been called to a blessing. You have been called to bless. Will you choose to rest in the blessing that you have already inherited, and will you choose to repay with blessing? To this you are called. Thank you. Awesome. Jenna, thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. That was great. Um, I guess I can take a vacation this Sunday, and uh, (laughs) I'm sure nobody would argue with a five-minute sermon. So thank you so much. That was great. And uh, let's pray for her. When is is National Fine Arts? Leaving on Monday. Monday. So let's just pray for her as she goes, because she's going to do it in front of like a whole lot of people. All right. So, God, we just thank you for Jenna. Lord, we thank you for her life and the work and the effort that she has put into this sermon. And, Lord, as she's getting ready to share it on even a larger stage, uh, God, we pray that you would just calm her nerves, uh, comfort her, God, give her those, th- those words to speak with confidence, Lord, that she would just do such an amazing job. Lord, we know that she loves you, and she's not doing this because it's any sort of competition, but she's doing it because she loves you and loves your word. And so we just pray that you continue to grow that in her life. Uh, Lord, as she moves on and continues to share this message. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, we are in Genesis. Uh, We are going to do chapter 32 and 33 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, chapters 32 and 33. Uh, Just as a way of reminder where we kind of left ourselves off last week, uh, we've been kind of looking at the dysfunction in this family, uh, especially uh, in regards to Jacob and uh, his relationship with Laban, Jacob's uh, relationship with his parents, his parents' relationship with the kids, and so forth. And uh, last week, I can say this tonight, especially because my father-in-law is in the room. Uh, if you remember last week, we said that family is like fudge. It's mostly sweet, but it's sprinkled with some nuts. <laughs> Love you, man. I'm just kidding. Uh, But this is the case, right? We know uh, that sometimes family is difficult. Sometimes family is dysfunctional. And where we left off in chapter 31 last week was Jacob finally separated from Laban and started heading back to the land that God promised. If you remember, God came to Jacob and said, go back to the land. Go back to the land that I had promised you. Uh, And and as he begins to leave, they kind of sneak out, uh, steal some of the the household gods, and Laban pursues them. Laban probably wants to kill Jacob, but uh, God tells Laban not to uh, say a word to him, and they kind of reconcile, if you will. And if you remember that Mizpah that we talked about, that Mizpah blessing, uh, it was them separating themselves, basically saying, you go that direction, I'll go this direction. I can't keep my eyes on you, but God will, and uh, may he uh, be the one that keeps his eye on you so you don't do anything to me. And they kind of go their separate ways. And so Laban goes back to uh, to, to his household, and Jacob continues on uh, back to the land after working for how many years under Laban? 20 years, 20 years. Because remember, six year, or seven years, and then he married uh, Leah, and then seven more years married Rachel, and then six more years for the livestock, okay? So 20 years, and now he's finally on his way back to this promised land. But here's the deal. Um, remember why he left? 
Yeah, to get away from Esau. Remember, he, he uh, kind of tricked his dad into giving him the blessing. Esau wants to kill him. Uh, his mom says, hey, uh, so Rebecca comes to him and says, hey, Esau, uh, Esau means to, to harm you. You better leave. And so he goes off to Laban. That's how this whole thing starts. And so now he's going back to this land, uh, knowing that his brother is there. Now, there's an interesting thing. I think it was in chapter 27 uh, when he left. Um, Rebecca says, I'll send word to you when the anger has left Esau and it's safe to come back. Well, he has never gotten any word. So in his mind, Esau probably still wants to kill him, right? So here we go. We're just going to uh, read right through uh, these two chapters. We'll stop and talk about them a little bit as we go. So verse 1 in chapter 32, it says, Jacob also went on his way. Now talking about Laban went his way, Jacob went his way. Uh, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. So he named that place Mahanam. Now what does that word mean, Mahanam? Two camps. So why would he call it two camps? Well, there's a camp of angels and his camp, right? He stopped the camp, but he recognized that there were also angels there. And so literally it means these, this double camp or two camps. And so uh, the interesting thing is throughout Scripture, sometimes God just gives people the eyes to see angels. I'm assuming the angels were probably with him all along the way, but God gives him the opportunity to actually see that the angels are there uh, with him because God says that he's going to protect him and provide for him. Um, it's interesting. I read a story. Um, it's from a, uh, a book that Billy Graham wrote, um, and he talks about a missionary uh, who uh, he and his wife were in a missionary compound, and the natives were coming in to try to drive them out and kill them. And the, uh, the, 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 the husband and wife, they just, it was just those two alone. They stayed inside, and they prayed all night. And eventually, like, uh, none of the natives came in and did them any harm. And I think a year later, as the story states, um, the, the chief of that tribe of people that were coming in to harm them uh, became a Christian, and the missionary said, hey, why didn't you come in? and kill us. And he said, well, there was all these guys that were encamped around you, and they were, like, protecting you guys, and we were afraid to go in. And the missionary was like, well, there wasn't anybody. It was just my wife and I. And so it's kind of like that same story. Like, sometimes God reveals what he's doing in the supernatural. Uh, so just interesting story to go along with that. Um, and that's from a book uh, by Billy Graham called Angels. Um, okay, verse 3. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau. Well, first of all, why are we moving on? Why do you think God just showed him angels? It doesn't say they said anything to him. It doesn't say that they did anything. It just says that he saw them. Why would God do that? Encourage him? Know that he's safe? Right? He's probably in fear for, well, not probably. We know he's fearing for his life heading to, to see Esau. So God's kind of give, giving him maybe confirmation. Remember, God's the one that told him to go back. And now he's on his way, probably a little nervous, and, and God give, shows him these angels. It says, Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my Lord Esau, your servant Jacob. Notice he says, your Lord Esau and your servant Esau. Jacob, this is what your servant Jacob says. I have been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle and donkeys, sheep and goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I may find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau and now he is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. So what's the reason? Is Jacob just bragging? Is he saying, hey, go to Esau and say, hey, I have donkeys, male and female. I have cattle. I have servants. I have all this stuff. What was the purpose of Jacob sending these guys ahead to say this to Esau? I'm not going to be a beggar. I'm not going to take, Yeah. Uh, most, most of the research I did was it was a way of him saying, okay, Esau, I, I know I took some things from you in the past, but I'm not coming back to take anything from you. I have plenty on my own. 
Like, I'm secure on my own. I don't, I'm not coming to, to steal from you. And, and it's interesting that he takes this submissive role where he calls Esau Lord and calls himself servant. He's really trying to kind of ingratiate himself back to his brother. But it says, what happens? Esau's coming with what? 400 men. So listen to Jacob's reaction. It says, in great fear and distress... Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. So obviously Jacob is afraid, and he's got a pretty good strategy here. He's like, if I divide everything in half, and he comes and destroys, and he fights against one group, the other group can escape. So maybe, at least maybe, we'll be able to keep half of the stuff that we have. And so he's in great fear that Esau is going to do something to him. And I thought it was interesting that now he divides his camp into two camps. And he named that place earlier Double Camp or Two Camps because of the angels that were camped there. Did he just forget that the angels were there to protect him? Don't know. It says, Then Jacob prayed. O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers of the their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. This actually shows a little bit of maturity from Jacob. Think about it. Esau, he, he believes Esau is coming to destroy him and to kill him. Now, he does do something in the natural and divide his camp into two, but what's the very next thing he does? He prays. Finally, he prays. He says, God, I need your help. Now listen, in his fear and in his prayer, he prays a couple things. The first thing he does is he reminds God, hey God, remember, you are the one that told me to go back. And you told me you would prosper me. God, I just want to remind you of your promise to me. And then he actually looks at his own life and says, God, I'm unworthy of the kindness that you've shown me. God, I'm not worthy of any of this, uh, but, but you did say that you were going to do this. So I think this is a good prayer. And I think sometimes this can be a, a model of prayer for us too. Like God didn't need to be reminded of his promise, but sometimes we need to be reminded of God's promise. And sometimes God's okay with us praying like, God, I remember when you told me, God, you said that you would, and I think it's okay to pray like that sometimes. I don't think it's unspiritual. I think we see that over and over in Scripture where in prayer people remind God of the promises that he made, and I think sometimes that helps uh, the one that's, that's moving in that. And so he says, I'm not worthy. I, I'm not worthy, but God, you said you were going to do this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count on you. I need your help. But in a sense, he's still not really... What's his faith, just in reality, what's his faith like right now? I'm just curious. I don't have an answer. But God told him to go back. God told him he would prosper. And now he's terrified and distressed and crying out to God. Is that okay or is that showing lack of faith? It's okay? Okay, I think we're divided. I think sometimes we are human and we kind of get scared, right? What do you think? Yeah, still scared that he was going to persecute them, yeah, even though God had spoken. Yeah, that's true. Faith is being stretched. Yeah, it could be because I remember in the last chapter, it was always the God of my father, the God of my grandfather, uh, the fear of my father. He never really said my Lord. 
could it be maybe his faith is beginning to transition from, like you just said, the faith of Abraham, and now he has to maybe start owning that faith himself instead of saying, this is the faith of, this is now, this is the faith that I have in you. Not because of them, but now I'm going to believe in you. I'm going to go forward because of that. Maybe owning up, owning his own faith now. Yeah, that's true because, you know, I was actually thinking about that earlier and I thought to myself, is this the first time that he's actually like stepping out in faith and obeying God who's speaking to him rather than his uh, father and grandfather? But then I thought back to that dream that he had when he was um, trying to get the the cattle to have stripes or spots and God gave him the ability to do that and it seems like reading between the lines that he obeyed God then too so in this process at least in the last six years he's beginning to listen to God and do what God says rather than what he's wanted to do his whole life and so he's kind of growing in that Yeah, he's got 400 men coming, and so he's got no choice but to depend on God, right? Yeah. So it says he spent the night there, and from, um, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats and 200 ewes, is that how you say that? And 20 rams. 30 female camels with their young 40 cows and 10 bulls, and 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. He put them in the care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, go ahead of me. Not behind me, go ahead of me. Go ahead of me and keep some space between the herds. He instructed uh, the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, who do you belong to and where are you going and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second and the third and all the others who followed the herds, you are to say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And be sure to say your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought if I, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Later when I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. All right, what's Jacob trying to do now? Bribe his brother, buy off his brother, try to maybe, um, you know, show his brother that he means him no harm, show his brother that he doesn't mean to steal anything from him, show his brother he doesn't need anything, um, and, and yes, probably part of it is trying to um, bribe him. Um, part of it might be an apology, too. Um, and, and we'll kind of get into that in a second. Um, but he's sending a lot of animals. And notice he's sending them ahead of himself. Right? He's not putting himself out front. He doesn't want to meet the 400 guys first. He wants, he wants the gifts to get there first. He wants to try to, well, he says, maybe I will pacify him. Maybe he'll say, oh, thanks for all these. Anybody ever butter you up with some gifts? Right? Try to bribe you into something? It's never happened. Never happened. I can't think, I, was, I should think of something. I can't think of anything. I don't think anybody, they bribe you with their words. They say, oh, Pastor Andy, great sermon on Sunday. But let me tell you about X, Y, Z. And yeah, you know, okay, sorry. You know what I mean. He's trying to get on his good side before he meets him face to face, right? Okay, so it says, that night Jacob got up and took his two wives his two female servants and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. Okay, so Jacob is sending all his possessions and his family on the other side, right? And now he's all by himself. He's alone. And now that he's alone, he's going to be able to hear from God. 
or maybe have some sort of interesting encounter with God. How many of you guys know sometimes you need to get alone to hear God? Sometimes you need to get to church. Sometimes you need to get alone. Sometimes you need to get around loved ones. But sometimes when you're alone and you can focus on God, listen to what happens. So now he's by himself. He sent his wives, his kids, and his possessions across. And now he's there by himself. It says, so Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, if you have never read the Bible before in your life and never heard this story before, this just sounds strange, doesn't it? I know Dan Rutledge was a wrestler, so maybe not strange to him, but here we have Jacob all by himself, and now it just says, and a man wrestled with him. It's just, is it, anybody else think that's weird? Well, who is this man? Who is it? Yeah. It, it's God, right? If it, you know, we talked about theophanies and Christophanies in the past in human form. Is it a pre-incarnate Christ? Uh, this is God. It says a man, but we're going to find out here that this is God and he wrestles with him. Interesting, I've never had a wrestling match with God. Not physically anyway. I don't, has anybody in here? Okay, so this is something strange and different and unique to Scripture. Uh, and he's doing it to somebody that is a unique human being. For hours, till daybreak, all night. All night long. How tiring is that, Dan? You can only go six minutes till the whistle, right? <laughs> So all night long, all night long until daybreak. And then Jacob says, I will not let go until you bless me. Um, one, of the, one of the commentators that I read wrote that God uh, had to wrestle all of Jacob's schemes and self-sufficiencies out of him. Just had to wrestle it out of him. Verse 27, it says, the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. So Jacob's name, we've now, this is the, this is, we've now a few times in Genesis seen God change somebody's name. And so Jacob's name, what does Jacob mean? Deceiver, supplanter, right? And now, do we know what the, the name Israel means? Struggles with God. Yeah, it says his name will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. So um, uh, an interesting thing, and I'm just going to read it to you. Uh, a scholar that I was reading about was, I've always, Israel means struggles with God. But th there's, there's another way that you could look at this meaning. And I'm just going to read this to you because it's above my knowledge. So I want to read somebody smart that, that wrote this. They said the name Israel is a compound word. Uh, meaning to fight, to struggle, or to rule. And El in Israel obviously means God. So some take the name to, of Israel to mean um, he who struggles with God or he who rules with God. But in Hebrew names, sometimes God is the object of the verb, not the subject. Daniel means God judges, not he judges God. And if this principle is applied, it would show us that Israel likely means God rules. Just an interesting, interesting thought. Struggles with God. God rules. Either way, his name is totally changed from being a deceiver, supplanter to God rules or struggles with God. Go ahead. And hang on a minute. Oh, yeah. Sorry. We're going to. We have to use a microphone, y'all, because not everybody can hear the sanctuary and people watching it online can't hear the question either. Uh, God fights. God fights. So you know what's interesting that it says God fights? Um, because if you read this, and it's actually, it's, tr it's not just the English translation, it's, it's the way it was really written. I want you to notice it says, a man wrestled with him. 
it doesn't necessarily say he wrestled with a man. And I think it says that twice, a man wrestled with him. And so it almost gives us God was the, the initiator, obviously, of the, so God fights makes sense. I've heard it said wrestles with God and prevails. Wrestles with God and prevails. Yeah, and I mean, that's kind of what it says here um, in, in verse 26, uh, or no, in verse 30, blah, blah, verse 28, I don't know where we're at. It says, his name will be Israel, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. So you have prevailed. The name of um, Israel in uh, the New King James, literally it means prince with God. Prince with God. So that would go under that, um, that word could mean wrestles or rules. So I could see them taking that rules as prince because that's a ruling thing. It's bad rap, but like, obviously God was using him to, to get alone, correct? And so like, in a way, even though he was doing his own thing, trying to please his brother, he, God still worked in that situation and weaved his own plan into that to get him alone. And then like, and then in just verse two, it says like, if you go to the Hebrew, it says, Jacob sent messengers with his face, it kind of reverberates to what, like, to this, the wrestling match. Now Jacob has God's face. Hence why he was, like, begging him, let me know what your name is. You know, I just, you know, I want to, have, I want to be your representative now, you know, type thing. So, yeah, and then later on he's going to rename that place, you know, yeah. about face with God. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, the connections. The part where it says that he struggled with God, that part we already explained that, but then it says, and with humans that have overcome. What does he mean by that part? Dude, he's been struggling with humans his whole life. Think about it. struggling with Laban, struggling with Esau, even, even with his father, you could say, because of the relationship with his father. And so he's been, he's had a whole life. I mean, Laban's sons, they were, they were against him. So he's been, hit, the last 20 years of his life have been a struggle if you will. And so um, you're also going to see some probably future uh, connotations to that. We'll go one with two more questions and we'll keep moving because we've got two chapters to get through. Can we, we'll go there and then Dan. I just thought of this, like it kind of is Romans 5 where it says through trials and tribulations comes perseverance and through perseverance comes a proven character. And literally like, Jacob's character has been refined like through this whole, like you were saying, like through all those trials, like like, he had to rely on God, and that's what God was doing. Again, get, to get him alone, he's like, all right, you have all this stuff. Let me get rid of all that stuff so you can focus on me, you know, like, instead of, so when you do meet your brother, you're going to have, I will be there with you, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting how God does it in our lives, too, where even in our disobedience and even in, like, some of the mistakes we make, God still knows how to take those circumstances and weave them for what he wants to do and accomplish and we see that all over the Old Testament. Yeah, the the name the Israel is it's a connective of many sayings, and what it boils down to is a, a prophetic name, because Israel will continue to always battle with man continually, and as a result of battling with man. He's also going to be fighting with God because he was giving in and sinning. So that is a kind of a circle name that you're going to be fighting and you're going to be overcoming, but you're going to get beat up. And then I'm going to come and I'm going to battle with you and beat you up until you repent. And then kind of the circle that you've always talked about. Yeah. Like it's, it's a prophetic connective of what Israel is. Yeah. <laughs> and is. Is today too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's good. That's a great point. It's a, it's like that cycle. They're continually struggling with God and continuing to struggle with man. As we see today, you just turn on the news. 
Um, okay, so God says you will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called that place Peniel, which means face of God, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed uh, Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Is that true still today? I didn't study that. Anybody know? Is that still true today? So they, part of their dietary would be not eating that tendon that attaches the hip. Interesting. So um, Jacob has two reminders of this encounter with God. What's the first reminder? Okay, there's three reminders of his... <laughs> Three reminders of his encounter with God. His name has changed. What else? His hip. And he also renames the place. So there's three different things that will point to this. And uh, so his limp, his limp um, is, is going to be a reminder for the rest of his life uh, of this uh, encounter that he had with God. Um, I, we've been studying leadership on Sunday. We've been looking at the life of David. And uh, I was reading um, part of an article a couple days ago. Um, and it was in regard to David, like in that season when he was in the cave and he was, you know, kind of wounded by Saul. And one of the things was, and I don't think it was new to this guy that wrote it. I can't remember who the author was. But he said, um, great leaders um, lead with a limp. Because oftentimes it's in those moments when you're wounded that you learn to lead and learn to do what God's called you to do. So it reminded me of, of Jacob. Now, he's, he's got a limp for the rest of his life. Um, and so kind of like it's memorial to his weakness and, and looking at God's strength. And it's also a reminder, like, he's got to depend on God. So if he ever thought he could fight Esau, now he's limping and he's, he's injured. He's on the IR, so he's not going to be able to fight him anyway. No, I, I didn't think of this, but I read it from, my, I think it was Dr. Constable, and he said... You have to take notice that when we do have an encounter with God, our walk is completely changed, and people notice that walk. And I just thought it was pretty cool. That, That's good. Yeah, that'll preach. You know, say, hey, what, what's with your walk? Well, he encountered God, and people should notice we're different. Our walk is different also. Yeah. That's good. I'm going to tuck that one away for a sermon sometime. <laughs> Okay, so now he's got a limp. So uh, chapter 32 ends. It says, therefore, um, to this day, Israelites do not eat that the socket. Uh, okay, you know what I mean. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> chapter 33. We still tracking? Did I skip anything? Okay, chapter 33 is a little bit shorter. Let's go. It says, Jacob looked up. So it's the next morning, right? Okay. He had this encounter all night wrestling with God. Now his hip is uh, hurting him. He's limping. He's got a new name. And the morning, the sun rises. And what does he see? He looks up, and there is Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front. Just saying. Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He wanted, you know, he, he, we know that Rebecca, I mean, not Rebecca, um, Rachel was the one he wanted, right? So she's last. So if they, they're going to have the, the best way to escape. So, I mean, Jacob, I, I mean, listen, I don't blame him. I'm not saying this is, like, sinful. This is just a guy being a guy, right? I'm going to put the female servants out front. I'm going to put my, my, my wives and my kids behind them. They're going to be the first line of attack. Yeah, um, but that's what it says. 
I keep losing my spot tonight. Um, Okay, so he's coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two female servants, put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and the children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. But listen, here's the difference. He himself went on ahead. So before, he sent everything out, and he said, well, tell Esau that I'm coming behind. But now, after this encounter with God, even though he lines his family up from least favorite to favorite, as as it seems, he's at least going to go out front and lead the way. So it says that he went out ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. And so... um, So he's not hiding anymore. He's going right out front. It says, but Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. Now, could you imagine being Jacob and you see the 400 men, you go up, you bow down seven times. And it says Esau was running towards him. I wonder when he first started running, if he was a little nervous. It doesn't say. I'm just, I don't know. Maybe at this point, with wrestling with God all night, he could care less what's going to happen to him, and he's just ready for what will happen. But either way, it says he looked up, and there was Esau coming with his four. I already read that. Uh, But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Then Esau looked up and saw the women and the children. Who are these with you, he asked. Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. Then the female servants and their, and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they bowed down. So this is like best case scenario, Right? I think my brother's going to kill me. I'm doing all this work to try to make sure that he doesn't kill me. And I finally see him and he runs and he hugs me and kisses me and weeps with me and says, who are these beautiful people with you? And he introduces his whole family to them. What a great reconciliation, right? Man, I wish we could reconcile as easy. Well, I shouldn't say as easy. It was 20 years. But they reconcile. It says, Esau asked, what's the meaning of all of these flocks and herds I met? To find favor in your eyes, my Lord, he said. But Esau said, I already have plenty. My brother, keep what you have for yourself. So Esau goes, I know you sent me all that stuff and you said, hey, this is a gift. But he's like, I don't need that. I have plenty. You keep them for yourselves, Jacob. And then Jacob replies, no, please, If I have found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Well, that has a new meaning, doesn't it? (laughs) To see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received me favorably, please accept the present that was brought to you. For God has been gracious to me and I have all I need. And because Jacob insisted, Esau accepted it. Now, I I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier, uh, but oftentimes people will say that um, possibly the reason for the gift was actually a way of him apologizing. Less of a bribe, less of, you know, it does say that he wanted to pacify him, but part of it is that he's trying to apologize. And uh, what I read was that in this culture, you would never accept a gift from your enemy. You would only accept a gift from your friend. And so the act, this kind of argument, and remember we talked about uh, the, the way that you would buy and sell things earlier with Abraham, how you would first say like a price and then you would say, no, I'll give it to you for free. And then you go back with the real price and then you go back and forth. Well, and that was kind of like the way they negotiated in those days. Well, it's kind of the same thing out of our cultural context. You wouldn't accept a gift from somebody that was your enemy. You would only accept the gift if they were your friend. And by accepting the gift, uh, in a sense, what Esau is saying is, I forgive you, we're good now. Does that make sense? Um, and so that's, so that's interesting. So he begged him to keep it, but then keeping the gift was, was basically his way of saying, okay, I accept your apology and we are, we are on good terms now. Then Esau said, let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are tender and that I, and that I must care for the ewes and the cows and the, and 
that are nursing their young. If they are driven hard, just one day all the animals will die. So let my Lord go ahead of his servant while I move along slowly at the pace of the flocks and the herds before me and the pace of the children until I come to my Lord. Esau said, then let me leave some of my men with you. But why do that, Jacob asked. Just let me find favor in the eyes of my Lord. So that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, went to Sakath, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sakath. Um, okay, we might have missed it here, but Esau says, let's go back. And Jacob says, no, I got these, I got, you know, some young uh, livestock. If I push them too hard, they'll die. And I got kids, you know, there's no way we can, we can go with you. And so Esau says, well, let me, let me leave some of my servants to help you. And Jacob's like, no, don't do that. You go on ahead and we'll be right behind you and we'll meet you there. But then if you understand the lay of the land, you'll realize that after Esau leaves, Jacob actually goes the opposite direction. Interesting. What do we think of that? Now, there's going to be good reason for this, but I just want to open it up. So after all this, he says, yeah, I'll be right behind you. And then goes the other way. What do you think? Still didn't trust him? Okay, got a little bit of that, a little bit of that Jacob still in him, even though his name's Israel. You know, it's interesting. Um, he's going to be called Jacob more often than Israel moving forward, even though his name was changed. So, you know, a preaching point. If we were preaching it tonight, you say, you know, you know, we are changed by God, but sometimes it's hard to get rid of that old man. That might be part of it. Is there a meaning to the place Sakath? Yeah, okay, so I know Anne wants to jump on this one. Um, so when we look at our feasts, our seven feasts, what's, one, what's the feast that comes to mind? Sukkot, yeah, which means shelters or booths, feast of booths, right? And so the name of the place, knowing that that's the meaning of it, booths or Sukkot, you know, uh, feast of booths, uh, what does he do there? He says he builds, builds for him a place builds a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. Um, yeah, it does say, um, yeah, so the word, I think when it says shelters for his livestock, I think, and I don't have anything but paper in front of me with the Bible on it, um, I think the word shelters there is actually a temporary shelter. I think it's that word. Yeah, so that's, so, so that's, it's, I love how scripture uses names and meanings and, and together. Um, so even though I'm reading from the NIV, and when it says that he made shelters for his livestock, the word shelter actually means a temporary um, a shelter. Go ahead. Still done today. Yep. Yep. In Forest Hills. Or wait. No, Squirrel Hills, Squirrel Hill. I don't know where I live, all right? I'm, I'm a Lancaster County boy, all right? We don't have very many, uh, uh, we don't have a big Jewish population in Lancaster County. Um, okay, so it goes the opposite direction, and then it says this. We'll, let's finish this up. After Jacob um, came to, and how do you pronounce that name? Oh, you weren't paying attention. Paddon, there you go, okay, just testing you guys. Um, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. For a hundred pieces of silver he bought from the sons of uh, Hamar, the, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. Okay, a tent is another temporary shelter. 
Um, there he set up an altar and called it El Elam, Israel. What does that mean? The God of Israel is God. Okay. Some say it means um, mighty is the God of Israel. But either way, he's kind of giving glory to God who God is, right? He's, he's recognizing that God is the one that has got him out of all of his troubles. All of the things and the dysfunctions that he put himself in, all of the weird and compromising situations that he's been through, he's realizing that God, when God spoke and said that, that you are going to have descendants in the land and they're going to be vast, that God is coming through on all his promises. And, and almost for the first time, you would seem that he's recognizing that God is God and God is mighty and God is doing something in his life and using him even in the midst of all his uh, dysfunction. And I just love that God uses him and he can use us in our dysfunction. And uh, God, is, God is a God who's going to get his uh, plan done <laughs> with or without us. Uh, but he, even in our mess-ups, he's going to use us. And, and I, I just love that. That's chapter 32 and 33. We can open it up for questions for a, a minute or two or three. I might not be able to answer any of them, but we'll open it up anyway. Just wait for a microphone at this point. We got a hand here and a hand here. Backing up, just thought it was curious. Um, after he put all of the the uh, herds in front, and and then he was dealing with his wives, he put them over the brook, but he stayed. And it was in the middle of the night that he moved them, but he stayed by himself, and that's where he he met God. But it was just curious to me why he stayed. Like, did he really want to get down to the mat with God himself? I do think that that's what it was. Because he had already cried out to God and prayed and said, I'm unworthy, you made these promises, uh, reminding you of what you said to me. I, I do, it doesn't tell us why, but I do feel like part of this is that he needed some alone time with God and was going to cry out to God knowing that the next day is a big day for him. Knowing, hey, think about it. A lot of times, you're going to war the next day. You, you're going to battle the next day. You're going to a big thing the next day. A huge event in your life is happening. A lot of times, people, that's a moment where they're like, I need a, I need a moment to myself. I need a moment with God. I, 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 I kind of feel like that's the reasoning behind it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll go over here. It seems to me that Esau was, you know, he's just like messing with his little brother. Because as soon as he heard he was coming, he thought, you know, he, he only needed to send a couple of guys with him to go. He said, I'm just going to mess with him and send 400 guys and watch him piss his pants and see what he does. And he saw, and then, and like he saw his brother do all these things that obviously he was probably trying not to laugh too hard. He said, all this, all this, he said my, my brother has changed somewhat, but not altogether. And then the final thing, you know, and they made up and all that, and then Joseph, you know, and then Joseph, whatever. Jacob was, was like, you know, was so relieved. And then he goes and pulls the stunt where he goes off. And it's like, and he's like, he couldn't even tell me he was going to do that. I mean, did we just not go through all this stuff? And he still pulls one of these little, you know, end yeah. runs. Where, I mean, it would have been nice to say, hey, you know what? I just need more land. I need to go over here. I don't want to crowd your space. But no, he just sort of, does, he, he, he just sort of doesn't follow him. And it's like. Esau's going like, he didn't change all that much, <laughs> obviously. He was being kind of jacob -y, you know? Yeah, well, I will say this. Um, I don't want to read into what's not in Scripture, and it doesn't really give us Jacob's mindset. And so part of me thinks um, maybe when he was coming with the 400 guys, he was intent on harming his brother. Um, and maybe when God is intervening in Jacob's life, he's also speaking to Esau. Um, or maybe... Because part of me thinks that if he's coming with 400 guys and he had his servants go out and they actually talked to Jacob. They said, hey, uh, we, this, is a, this is a gift for you and, and Jacob's coming behind you. You would think he would communicate to them. Well, tell him that I love him and I want to see him. 
It doesn't get communicated. So maybe it was a last second. Maybe it was a, I mean to do harm to my brother. I see him. God works in my heart because of what God's doing to him. And we, in that moment, there's a change. We just don't know. It could be, or he could have made him want to pee his pants, as you said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he never told him, because maybe he was. We don't know. Yeah. You know, we all, uh, I'll, I'll make it real quick. God is always working in the background, and we'll remember the departing when Esau was taking comfort that he was going to kill Jacob. So that's how he left it, because according to him, Jacob took the birthright, the inheritance. Jacob was coming back and saying, look, I'm not coming back to claim your inheritance. I have an inheritance. And in the background, God had blessed Esau to the point, which he promised to do, that he blessed him enough that in his forthcoming toward Jacob, he was also showing that, hey, look, I don't need yours because God did bless me and I have although it was a worldly inheritance, as we'll go on to see in Esau's life. But that's the way Esau was. Yeah. He wasn't forthcoming with God. And that's one thing we've got to remember in our lives now. When we see our, quote, counterparts being prosperous, it is all for good. It's all for God. And we have to keep that in mind that it can be some type of way that it's our blessing also. Esau didn't need to go after Jacob because God took care of Esau. He didn't feel threatened whatsoever, and he didn't feel that he was going to come to take his inheritance. Esau had what he wanted. He said that in here. I have what I want. I got what I wanted. Yeah. I don't need yours in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And just going off what Dan was saying, like you were saying like, like, Jacob did what God wanted him to do, correct? Like, he went, right, he did what God wanted him to do. He went and went back to the land, made up with his brother, correct? He did everything, right? And I think the fact that he went someplace else instead of following Esau shows a lot of growth. Because if you think about it, he could if he went with, like, where Esau went, the whole Laban situation probably would happen again. Like, their, their herds would have got combined. And the whole situation arose again, and he learned, like, no. And on top of that, like what Dan's saying, he, he knew, like, he, he met God in those areas. And we're going to get to when he goes back to Bethel and all that. But he knew, like, this is where God wants me, you know. So I, I, in a way, I don't think he was disobeying or anything by going the opposite direction. He knew, like, yeah, I, my brother, you know, he has a bunch of worldly things. I don't want that. I want to be where God is. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, and you can look at it a million different ways, too, because we don't know. Um, I guess the reason why we would say that he was, quote-unquote, a deceiver again is because he does tell his brother, hey, I'll be right behind you, but he doesn't. So that, I think that's the, the connection on that, but that's, that's a good point. I, I still want to know why he needed to bring 400 men because – you're bringing 400 men. There's a reason. And like you said, could he have changed his mind? So when I look at it from my perspective now as a man, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, not yours, not Esau's, and not Jacob's. And when you look back on it, he had a wrestle with Jacob. Jacob then cried out to him. So I, I'm just curious where Esau came, Esau came, you know, because he's coming with what? What if he, like my brother said over there, what if he only came with just two or three? Would Jacob still have that fear versus? That's a really good point, Mark. <laughs> Listen to you. No, I'm serious. Think about this for a second. No, that's a really good point. That's making me think. If, if he right. comes by himself and Jacob's got all his servants and his, all his entourage and he's meeting Esau with three guys, does he really feel a need to call out to the Lord and depend on the Lord because in his own strength, he could probably overcome Esau. 
So that's probably one of the reasons why God sends 400. It, it kind of for sometimes when, yeah, and he's wounded. Yeah. So, I mean, he's desperate for God. And sometimes God puts us in those situations where we will look up and say, we can't do this on our own. And we have, he almost purposely puts him in a place where he has to be 100% dependent on God, um, which that's a really good point, Mark. I appreciate that. In the New Testament, uh, Jesus got alone to seek God. And so I just think that sometimes you don't need all that background noise, whatever, being in the camp. Yeah. You know, you want to be quiet and be yeah. able to hear the. Yeah, I get, get alone with God. Yeah. Last but not least. Go ahead. Put the, put the mic up to oh, your I'm mouth. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm used to talking with my hands. Um, if we prevail with God in prayer, if we travail with God in prayer, we will prevail in life with God. I think that travailing is pr in prayer is our surrender to his lordship. When Over each situation, okay, you're lord over this. That doesn't mean we give up and don't expect a, a, an answer. I think that's where a lot of the questioning is in the faith message. Uh, we think, oh, well, that person died. Well, that was God's will. Not always. Not always. I'm not trying to be controversial here, but it is often because we as a body or as an individual did not do our part in travailing in prayer so that we could prevail even for someone else's life in, 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 their li in our lifetime. And it is the lordship that we, we travail for, his lordship over that situation. And if we know the promises of God and we speak the promises of God and we live the promises of God, and I'm not saying I do all that. I'm just saying that is a goal. And then the lordship of Christ, he is lord over that situation. And that doesn't mean we give up or quit or say, oh, well, that was God's will. You know, I mean, that's, that, that's a lot of the root of not prevailing in the word. You know, there's a lot to do in your prevailing prayer. Speak the word. Pray. Intercede. Speak the word over the person. Speak the word over your own life. There's a lot we should do and we don't. It's not that we bring it about. But when we're surrendered and have that broken hip, you know, or thigh, whatever that was, then that's how the lordship of Christ moves in. We move out and he moves in. So sometimes we need to have that limp and that brokenness in our life to be able to get before the Lord the way that we ought to rather than just kind of coasting. Um, and he's called us into a life of prayer. And, yeah, sometimes we can uh, neglect our duty uh, that God's called us to. With that, it's 8.01. I'm going to... I'm going to do the most dangerous thing I've done all night and ask you to pray us out. <laughs> he says that all the time. And just real quick, when we learn the lesson you learn from this scripture verse where Jacob does cry out to God, that's what God wants to hear. He wants to hear... He, People will say, I wish I could pray like that, like Billy Graham or Pastor Hoover or, or whatever. No, God wants to hear from your heart. He just, all he wants to hear is have a father, daddy. And when I see my granddaughters run to daddy, daddy's home. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for this evening. We thank you for the teachings that we had. We thank you for the worship team. Lord, as we go from here, let us be a light in the darkness and continue moving forward in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a great night and we'll uh, see you Sunday.